Hi, everybody. We're going to talk about the end of World War I and how we made peace. But before we do that, my son wants to say hi. Can you look at the camera hi. and say hi? Look up here at the camera. Hi. hi. All right, go upstairs. I'm, I'm doing the same right <laughs> now. I don't want him to see me. Sorry, I had to pause it long enough so you didn't hear him running up the stairs like an elephant. Uh, we are going to talk about the end of World War One today. We are dealing with U.S. History Standards 28 and 29. So by the end of this set of notes, you should be able to explain to me one of the major turning points of World War One. You should be able to explain to me who John J. Pershing was and the importance of the American Expeditionary Force. Um, you should be able to tell me what a do what a doughboy is. And you should be able to tell me a little bit about Alvin C. York and what he won his medals for. Um, uh, U.S. 29. That's my son in the background, if you can hear him. <laughs> I'm sorry if you heard that. That was my husband and my son wrestling and my husband was doing the count, the one, two, three count. I swear we don't beat our child. Um U.S. History 29 standard says that you should be able to analyze um, the goals of the major world leaders, including Woodrow Wilson and our 14 points, um, and the causes and effects of the United States rejecting the League of Nations and how that affected the rest of the world. All right, so the first thing we got to figure out is, is how we manage to get materials and supplies to Europe. Now, this is before we ever send soldiers. We figured this out very early on in the war um, in response to German unlimited submarine warfare. Uh, we don't want to get our ships sunk, so we come up with this thing called the convoy system. And what the convoy system said was instead of just having one ship take a chance and go across to bring something to Ireland or to Britain or to France and, you know, kind of cross our fingers and pray that it doesn't get sunk by a German submarine. We would have a group of them go all at once and they would be escorted by Navy ships. Okay. So ships that are able to hunt down and sink the submarines. And yes, before you ask submarines can to be sunk. Okay. Um, now, they're going to give supplies both to merchant ships, ships that are selling things in Europe, and to troop transport ships that are bringing troops to Europe. Um, now, the convoy system ends up uh, cutting our shipping losses by more than half. All right, so American troops are going to join the fight. Um, American troops will arrive in Europe in June of 1917. Now, this is not massive scale troops. Uh, we don't start showing up in huge numbers until 1918, but we send what we can in, in June, right after we declare war. Um, by 1918, U.S. troops have assumed most of the actual burden on the battlefield, which makes sense, right? We're the newer soldiers. Um, we're... we're less war fatigued. Uh, we, we are all gung ho about this war. We're not beaten down by it yet. Um, the guy in charge of our troops um, is General John J. Pershing. He is the commander of the U.S. troops in Europe, and he specifically keeps the U.S. troops as a separate fighting force for a couple of reasons. Um, the head of the allied troops in, in, in England. So the head of the French, British, you know, the other 30 odd allied troops, the Supreme Allied Commander at this time was a guy named Ferdinand Falk, F-O-C-H. And he basically thinks Americans are idiots, right? He, he doesn't think Americans know how to fight. Um, so he wants to use Americans as kind of filler um, he wants to separate the American force and put them under foreign commanders. And uh, Pershing's not going to allow that to happen. Um, on top of that, Pershing doesn't want to give any undue credit to anyone. Um, he wants people to understand this is an American force. We are fighting on our own and all of our wins are because we're good. There's more to it than that, but that's a lot of it. All right, so the Battle of Bellow Wood. This is a major turning point in the war. This is what's going to stop the massive German force headed for Paris. Uh, by this point, uh, the Germans are within 45 miles of Paris. And if they can take Paris, they will end this war. It'll be over. Um, the Allies are desperate for a couple of reasons. One of the major ones is the Russians have had another rev revolution. 
They had a revolution a few months earlier that wasn't the communist revolution. Um, they had tried to put a democracy in power, but it wasn't working well. And the democracy was trying to keep fighting in World War One, and it was it was stretched too thin. Um, in April of 1917, you get the communist revolution in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, B O L S H E V I K, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and they are going to have to decide, do we pull out of World War I and make our own separate peace and focus on our country now? Or do we keep sending men to die in a war that most of our citizens didn't support in the first place? And they decide to pull out of the war. Um, so to, to us and to the rest of the allies, they're traitors, right? They're leaving us alone. Um, but to, for a lot of Germans, this was, you know, bringing men home that were dying for no reason. Uh, it is important to note here that uh, the allies will treat Russia as an enemy because of this. Uh, they will... I'm trying to think of how to describe it. Um, Russia actually is, loses territory that they didn't actually lose uh, during the war. We take territory away from them in the peace treaty because we're mad at them. Uh, so you've got this massive German force now can can head to France because Russia has pulled out. If you remember the map we had, you had Germany in the middle and then Russia was here and then France was over here. And the problem you had with that was Germany had to split its forces, right? Germany had to take a large chunk of its forces and send it to fight in Russia and take the rest of it and send it towards France. Well, now they're not fighting in Russia anymore. So that huge force that was fighting in Russia can now turn and head to France. And that's what's going to happen. And then we show up. The U.S. soldiers kind of show up um, right at the last minute, like right when they needed us to. Sorry about that lag there. I had to go back and change that date. It was said 1917 and it shouldn't have. Um, so American troops are showing up in force right about the time that this war is taking happen, going on. Okay. Um, the Marines show up on June 6th. The battle actually started on June 2nd. Um, but this battle is going to last, you know, three weeks. Um, but the Marines, when they show up, they are tasked with taking kind of the impossible area. They're tasked with taking a stretch of land known as Belial Wood. Um, this is a set of open fields and a 200 plus acre deep woods um, where the Germans had already dug in. This was German territory we were told to take. Um, they had modern artillery guns. They had uh, anti-trench mortars. They had heavy machine guns. They had poison. You name it, they had it. And we were supposed to go take it. Um, it was going to be hard and it was going to suck, but we had to take Billy O. Wood if we were going to be able to turn the Germans back. So it is the Marines who are told to go after this and do this. Okay. Now this is a famous uh, painting of the Marines fighting at Billy O. Wood. Uh, you'll see them all wearing the gas masks because whenever the Germans got attacked um, and they knew they were dying, they just set off the gas to kill whatever was there. Um, so a couple of, of famous things that you need to know. Uh, as these Marines are heading towards Belia Wood, right, as they're heading towards this stretch of land that they were told to go take, they, uh, and, and they encounter French troops that are retreating, that are running away from the advancing German army. And they tell the Marines, leave, you got to go. This is bad. You were, were, retreat. They're, they're coming and they will kill you. Um, and in true Marine fashion, the Marine who was told this, uh, his name was uh, Captain Lloyd Williams. His response was, retreat, hell, we just got here, right? No, we're not leaving. <laughs> we were given a job to do. We're going to go do it. Um, and that's what they do. They do. And they dig in in Bellio Wood. And it, they take massive losses. Um, but don't giggle yet. Okay. Uh, Marines had to cross a, a wide open wheat field, no trees, no cover, nothing. Um, and the German machine guns were just mowing Marines down. And the Marines had almost no artillery support from the allies. There was almost no one who was shelling the machine guns to get them to stop firing. Um, and they got to take it. Like, the, a Marine can't just sit back and say, no, I don't feel like it today. 
So the Marines were told, you got to go across this field. You got to, you got to take this. Um, they had to go take those machine guns. And um, one of the guys in charge that day, Sergeant Major, um, everybody called him Dan Daly or Daly, um, to rouse up his men uh, was, was credited with saying, come on, you sons of bleeps. Do you want to live forever? Right? Like, what else are you going to do? Right. You might as well die doing something epic. Um, now, more than a thousand Marines are going to be killed just on that day. Just on that day when they were crossing that wheat field, they lost almost a thousand men that day. Um, but that kind of shows you the spirit of the Marines, right? You got to remember the Marines were kind of our first special forces groups. Um, and to this day, every Marine is a rifleman. Okay. So every Marine gets specialized training in certain areas that not all branches of the military get. Um, and if you go to the Marine Museum, right outside of Quantico, Virginia, this quote from Sergeant, Daly, from Sergeant Daly is inscribed on that museum. Like that, that is how much this represents the Marines. Okay. Um, the Marines get their nickname from their fighting in Belio Wood. Um, the Germans started to call them uh, Tefuhutend, which means the hounds from hell, right? Basically, once they get a hold of something, they're never going to let it go. Um, and Marines have been known as devil dogs ever since. Okay, so the, the devil dog logo, most of you guys have seen. Uh, the, those of you who have a friend who's in a Marine Corps, um, a lot of times they'll get tattoos that have the devil dog on it. It's usually a bulldog. Um, but they'll have, you know, some reference to devil dogs. Uh, that comes from World War I. All right, Doughboys. Okay, Doughboys are U.S. soldiers. That is our nick. That is our nickname in the war, um, and they're going to start to distinguish themselves. And there's a bunch of people I could give you. Um, the the first one I'm or the only one that that's in your standards that I'm going to cover. I'll give you more in class, but the only ones in your standards that I'm going to cover is Alvin Seawork. Uh, he was a Tennessean. He was from Paul Mall, Tennessee, so very very small town. He grew up very very poor. Uh, he was a conscientious objector. Uh, which means that he did not actually believe in war. He didn't want to go, um, not because he didn't he didn't want to support his country, but because he honestly didn't feel like that was something God wanted for him. He was kind of a little bit of a hellraiser whenever he was younger. You know, he he drank a lot and he 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 ran with kind of the wrong crowds, um, and he he kind of famously found religion, and and that's whenever he becomes a conscientious objector. Um, now he will become the most decorated soldier of the great war. Um, he will win the congressional medal of honor, which is the highest medal, uh, for, for combat valor America gives. Um, he wins a bunch of other medals too. He also wins the Croix du Guerre, which is the French version of the medal of honor. Uh, now, interestingly enough, he is not the first American to win the Croix du Guerre um, from this war. Um, the first American was actually someone who was um, under Pershing's command. Uh, his, that was a black man named. Uh, Henry Johnson. There's a black man named Henry Johnson. Um, he was fighting out of the 369th Infantry Division out of Harlem. Um, if you ever have time to Google and you are looking for something really interesting to Google, Google the 369th Infantry Division. It was one of the few black combat units America had in World War I. Um, in World War I, our armed forces were still segregated, so our black troops uh, were, were separate. They were all black units under white commanders, and they almost always did not serve in combat positions, but the 369th did. Um, they're going to earn themselves two nicknames in World War I. One's going to be the Harlem Hellfighters, and the other one's going to be the Black Rattlers. Um, so if you ever have, if you're ever interested in something like that, I really recommend you look them up. Um, they did some crazy stuff, uh, mostly because they were lent out to the French. That's what Pershing lent them out to the French. Um, and the French kind of used them as meat shields and they kept living. Um, so you'll, you'll get to see that. And, and it's a wonderful story. I suggest you, you, you look that up. Um, now he will out back to Alvin Seawork. Okay. Um, he is going to win a bunch of medals uh, for combat valor. 
um, he captures 132 German soldiers, uh, almost single-handedly. He did have a couple of men in his unit, but he's the one who charged up the hill. He was taking machine gun nests. Um, so he snuck up along the side of the machine gun nest and started taking them off one at a time until they surrendered. Um, and and they're going to, and he and what's left of his platoon uh, are going to march them all over heck and back, trying to fit, find a place that's willing to take all these German soldiers. Um, and they do eventually, and he gets awarded the, for the medal for this. Um, the war ends. Okay, not too long after most Americans show up. Um, we don't start seeing significant numbers of Americans until right before the Battle of Belleau Wood. Um, so we are there in massive numbers for a little more than eight months. Uh, and then the war ends, right? You got an armistice um, on 11th of November, 1918. Okay, um, they actually signed the armistice on November 11th at 11 a.m which means they are still shooting at each other until the clock hits 11 o'clock on 11, 11, 1918. They thought that would be symbolic. Um, now an armistice is not a peace treaty. It is not the end of the war. An armistice is an agreement to stop fighting while you work out the peace treaty. Now, just in the short amount of time we had been there, the U S lost over 50,000 men in combat um, and more than 230,000 soldiers had been wounded in this war. So this is a very significant war for us. We lost way more people than we thought we were going to. Okay, this is a, a huge casualty losses when you consider how little, what, what the little amount of time we were there was. Um, Wilson issued bef right before the war ended. Um, he issued something called the 14 points. Um, these were things that he had said, we need to end this war. Um, this war was a stupid war. It was a sucky war. It should never have happened. We as, as an, as a, we as a country, you as countries, you know, so us as a collective international organization should never have allowed this war to happen. So he issues, um, basically a peace plan, a plan for fair and lasting peace. Um, they had 14 points to it. Um, and I'll, most of those points dealed with letting countries decide their own types of government, letting countries decide whether or not they want to be a territory of an empire or an independent country. That's self-determination right here. Okay. Do you want to be your own country or do you, are you okay with being a territory? Um, self-government being allowed, didn't matter if you are a territory or not, but being allowed to write the laws for your own country was a big deal in this. And for him, the most important was the League of Nations. Now, the League of Nations would be an international peacekeeping organization. And member countries would meet to resolve international disputes. So the goal here is, is to try to avoid future wars. Um, this was what will become the modern day United Nations. Um, it's not on your notes, but you need to know this. A couple major problems with the League of Nations, okay? Uh, membership was voluntary. The League of Nations did not have an armed force uh, that so that there was no way for them to enforce their decisions. Um, and then not only was membership voluntary, but once they decided something, if you didn't like it, you didn't have to listen to it. So acceptance of what they decide was voluntary. So there's not a lot of power involved in the League of Nations. Um, and President Wilson is convinced that the League of Nations is what will, will, will keep us out of another war. Um, but Senate's having a hard time agreeing to the League of Nations because if we join the League of Nations, theoretically, the we would have to go through the League of Nations if we ever wanted to declare war. So if a country did something to us and we wanted to declare war against them, if we were members of the League of Nations, we were supposed to go through the League of Nations and see if we can work it out first. Um, and uh, Congress does not want to give up their power to declare war. Like that's the one of the biggest powers of Congress. They don't want to lose that. So Wilson decides to do what he had done before the war to get special laws passed. Um, he traveled across the country giving stump speeches, those, those pre-planned, pre-written speeches that you give the exact same speech in different locations. 
Um, and he's giving them across the nation specifically to promote um, the, the Treaty of Versailles and the 14 points that were that was part of it. Um, Wilson, unfortunately, has a massive stroke that leaves him partially paralyzed while he's on this cross-country speech tour. So he has to abandon that campaign, which means he loses that momentum. He loses that public support. Not only does, is he losing public support, but there are people in Congress that are actively working against him. Uh, this guy, Henry Cabot Lodge. Okay. Sorry. Uh, he is mad at Wilson for a bunch of reasons. One of them is that he had offered to go to Europe with Wilson to help work out the treaty. Um, and Wilson told him no. Wilson was a Democrat. Henry Cabot Lodge was a Republican. And Wilson basically very publicly turned him down. So Henry Cabot Lodge lost face. So Lodge is basically not going to go along with anything Wilson comes up with. Um, and then Lodge honestly believed this was a bad plan, right? He didn't want um, our foreign policy to be tied to the League of Nations. Not only could the League of Nations stop us from declaring war, but if the League of Nations decided war was necessary as a member, we were supposed to go to war with it. Um, and they did not want the U.S. to get drug into another stupid war. Okay. So because we never joined the League of Nations, we, we're still technically at war. So we don't sign the Treaty of Versailles. We end up signing separate peace treaties with each of the central powers that basically just say we're no longer at war with each other. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles. You've got brand new countries created from this. Germany uh, is forced to pay off reparations. Um, the Treaty of Versailles has something called the War Guilt Clause, um, which basically says it, the war is Germany's fault. All of it. Germany's fault. Now, keep in mind, this war started out as a disagreement between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. But the Allies decide it's all Germany's fault. Germany must be punished. And they have to pay reparations, which are payments for loss or damage. Okay, They are payments um, that the Allies are demanding from Germany. You caused all this damage. You now have to give us money so we can repair that damage. Um, and the reparations in the Treaty of Versailles force Germany to take on the burden for the cost of the war. Um, and this war was on such a massive scale that it was almost impossible for the Allies to even estimate um, how much money it would cost to fix all the problems they, that the war had caused. So the Allies, in the Treaty of Versailles, um, refused to name a certain figure that Germany had to pay. They just had to keep making payments. Um, and they, they refused to list a time or a date when the payments would end. Um, now, each payment was supposed to equal to 96,000 tons of gold. Uh, and they do keep making payments. The final payment was made on the 3rd of October, 2010. Um, now, obviously, they're not paying reparations during World War II. But after, after we whoop them in World War II, they have to go back to paying reparations again. Um, some of the new countries that are created. You have uh, the countries that are being carved up into little pieces. Um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is being carved up. The Russian Empire is being carved up. Germany loses a lot of territory, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a uh, an empire yet. So it was it's not losing separate territories. It's actually losing parts of its country. Um, all told, you're going to get nine brand new nations created: um, Austria, Hungary. Okay, so they, they they break up that empire into two separate countries. Um, they also add Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Poland, Finland, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. Um, now, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia are known as the Baltic countries because they're on the Black Sea. This is land that was taken away from Russia. Okay, so I want you to focus kind of... Here we go. I want you to focus sort of on land in that region for a second. Okay, got it. All right, so it's going to go from looking like that to, well, that's a zoomed in picture. <laughs> I tried uh, to looking like this. So this is Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. That's land that Russia lost. Okay. 
um, all the land you see with the stripes on it, that's all brand new land. That's all land that was taken away from, from, from Germany or Poland or sorry, Germany or Austria. Uh, so Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, that's land that was taken away from Russia. Okay. Um, Poland is land that was taken away from Germany and from Austria, Hungary. You're also going to get some brand new baby countries uh, between Germany and Poland. Um, so these are specifically to protect Poland from German invasion. Um, you got West Prussia, Posen, um, East Prussia, which is still part of Germany. This really, by the way, this part here really ticks off Germany because this is Germany and this is Germany. Okay. So if you look, both purple sections, they're both Germany and they are now divided by Prussia. Okay. They are now divided by a separate country. Okay. Um, and, and Prussia was given that. Okay, Poland was given that basically um, to give Poland access to the sea so Poland wouldn't be landlocked. Um, but now Germany has to find a way to run a country when part of its country is separated by it by another country. Okay, that would be like Mexico taking over everything from uh, the Mexican border in a straight, very thin straight line all the way up to Canada. Right. How are we going to have a country when we have to fly over another country just to get to the uh, to California? OK, so if California is ours and then there's a strip next to California that's not. How, how do you govern that? Because you'd be flying through international airspace just to just to get to it. So your only other option is to what get in the water and like sail, I guess. But then you'd be sailing through international waters and you'd have the same problems. So it's, this is going to be hard for Germany to deal with. Um, you also get Czechoslovakia, Austria, Hungary, Romania. Okay. Um, this area right here, um, Alsace and Lorraine, these are German territories that are actually ceded to France. So you have German people being given to France, and that's going to cause a major, major issue. Um, we'll talk about that whenever we get to World War II. Um, and we kind of break Germany so bad, we create the problem of Adolf Hitler. Okay. Um, Germany is not treated at all fairly in this war or in this, in this Treaty of Versailles. Um, not that they needed to be treated fairly. I mean, they did lose. So you don't want, you don't need to treat them like they had won, but they are forced to shoulder more burden than was actually theirs. Um, we intentionally broke their country. Um, for example, their military, whenever we, the Treaty of Versailles specifies how big the German military can get. Um, the German military can't have more than 100,000 soldiers. That's not even big enough for Germany to have a functioning National Guard. And that's as big as they're allowed to get. Um, they can't have an Air Force. Um, they can have a Navy, but the Navy can only have 12 surface ships. And of those 12 surface ships, only six of them are allowed to be armed. I don't know what they were going to do with the other six. Um, they can't have any submarines at all. So we, we purposely cripple their military. Um, and then we go back in and we cripple their economy by demanding those reparations every year. Okay, By demanding they come up with that massive amount of money every year forever. And, and it's just, there's no way their economy can bounce back from that. Um, plus, you got to keep in mind, a lot of Germany's economy before the war was focused on building up their military, right? They had factories and industries that were dedicated to the war effort, and now they can't have a military, so a lot of their industries are going to go kaput. Um, and Germany's going to start looking for a way out. They're going to start looking for a savior. Um, and Hitler is a guy who comes in at the right time, who knows the right things to say. Uh, he comes in at a time when people are furious uh, with the, the rest of Europe for let it, for allowing this to happen and for doing this to Germany. And, and Hitler is very much a nationalist. He's going to, he's going to make people feel proud of being German again. Um, for example, he says, no, we do not pardon. We demand vengeance, not justice anymore. He's not saying we want to be treated fairly. He's saying, Y'all did us wrong and we're going to come back at you for it. 
that is what gets Hitler so much support in Germany. And we'll talk more about this whenever we get into the 1930s. And that is it.